Good afternoon. I feel very honored and nervous to present Wendy at this so special occasion. It is a great privilege to be able to speak about a woman I deeply admire, a colleague, a friend, a comrade, a mentor. One of Wendy's many academic contributions relates to women in the politics of place, of the political, material, and symbolic appropriation of place that makes us who we are in articulation with diverse others and allows for the manifestation of diverse identities, capacities, interactions, and initiatives. I will be speaking to you as a woman of the South, as a Latin American. And I felt that it is an interesting coincidence that we are celebrating Wendy's inauguration, the year that many Latin American universities are celebrating 100 years of the reform of Cordoba. This reform revolutionized the concept and the running of universities. So much changed as the result of it. Who could study what, how, how were universities going to be governed? Co-government by students, professors, and graduates is one of its main legacies. It must also be said that the manifest was signed only by men. As women, though not formally excluded from the university, were considered by the dominant discourses and social practices as inferior, incapable, and even subject to male tutelage. I feel that this event today can be seen as a step in the celebrations that will take place throughout the year. We are celebrating on the 8th of March a woman professor. And a woman that has made so many contributions in relation to places of learning, challenging epistemic violence, contributing to the recognition and value of a diversity of knowledges and knowledge production. In this respect, Wendy has the double ability to command, to motivate, to get things done, not for the sake of deadlines or fulfilling duties, but for the sake of novelty, transformation, justice. She infuses self-confidence in others and helps to get the best out of them. And at the same time, she always exercises hospitality in what Maurice Hamilton has called feminist hospitality that can subvert hospitality-infused hierarchies, breaking the view that the host gives and the guest receives. For feminist hospitality, the distinction between guest and host is blurred as both learn and grow together. In this way, as a lecturer, a researcher, a writer, a feminist, a militant, Wendy has been open to and promoted the right to difference which is the right anchored in diversity, but it goes beyond recognizing the tension between being and becoming. And it's this becoming, the yet to come, the imagination of caring futures that inspire much of Wendy's work. She has engaged and made significant contributions on key areas, such as critical views on development, including feminist perspectives on sustainable development, feminist political ecology, body politics, women's empowerment, sexuality and reproductive rights, politics of place, women and the new communication technologies, transnational feminist movements, the care economy. She has done this as editor of the journal Development and as member of the International Governing Council of the Society for International Development, working with WIDE, Women and Development Europe, and with other European and international NGO and social networks, contributing with UN documents and conferences at Professor as ISS. Mostly, she had a leading role in promoting non-conventional approaches to old topics and encouraging research on new ones, inviting contributions from different parts of the world, from women and men from different backgrounds, engaging activists, crossing lines between academy, politics, and social engagement. In doing all this, she has deployed her unique organizing abilities, 
whether alone with another person in a team as part of a network. From a women's tent at a UN conference, a workshop in a convent, an academic seminar, a book, books, a research project, a community gathering, a feminist presentation at the World Social Forum, the activity will be characterized by excellence, by reaching the goal set, by providing relevant and groundbreaking content, by camaraderie, mutuality, by this sense of future, of all what is ahead and can be realized with the same energy, trust, communality. As I got to know Wendy more, basically through our common projects, seminars, exchange of emails, shared papers, and I didn't cease to be mesmerized by her work capacity, her motivation, her wonderful results, I also discovered a Wendy that doubts has fears, is unsure. I learned that she experiences the pain of the tensions, the needs and demands from family, academy, community, travel, politics, place. She has built a life that is many lives, not always in harmony, stretching herself to fulfill the expectations of those who embrace the various parts that she is. In a draft paper for an all common project not yet realized, she wrote, but in reality, I just wanted to follow love. I think that this statement by Wendy summarizes her journey. She was referring to her young years falling in love with Claudio, but I believe it includes her choices and trajectories in many respects, also in academy. As stated by the Uruguayan priest and human rights defender, Luis Perez Aguirre, today, no one holds that reason can explain and encompass everything. Below, there is something older, deeper, more elementary and primitive than reason, sensitivity. The ability to be affected and affect implies a form of knowledge much more encompassing and profound than reason because to educate is to make ourselves and others vulnerable to love. Wendy has walked this rich and admirable path following love, feeling the pain caused by the destruction of development promises, by the prepotency and imposition of Western patriarchal <coughs> anthropocentric views and policies, by the no alternative discourse, and has embraced with others the commitment to imagine and build a different world. She has taught us, we have learned together, that this requires an epistemic and cultural strategy aimed at opening spaces to think and understand reality in a relationship with other human beings and nature in a different way. That different forms of knowledge need to be made visible and validated to reach social, cultural, environmental, and economic transfor transformations based on the subjective, on women's and communities' agency, that we need to build alliances to be caring, to be compassionate. For her contribution, her generous way of being an academic, a feminist, a scholar, a friend, I want to thank Wendy. And I want to congratulate ISS for having her as professor of gender, diversity and sustainable development. And for celebrating a day of struggle for women's rights, honoring a woman who has dedicated her life to imagine and work hard for a better world. Well, first of all, thank you, Anna. That was really from the heart. And um, I'm now going to have to take a deep breath and say, <laughs> dear Rector Magnificus, dear Excellencies, dear visitors from abroad, dear colleagues, students, friends and family. When writing this lecture, my mind has been full of many different stories. 
Like most educated people, with the privilege of time to read and reflect, my every day is peppered by a hum of information. It shapes my sense of living in a world about to teeter off the edge. Yet it also keeps me hopeful with glimpses of possibilities for change. When we read the news, we are greeted every day with alarms of climate crisis, plastics choking the sea, increasing unacceptable inequalities, rampant consumerism, unresponsive democracies, ruined environments, cultural losses, drowning and dying refugees, conflicts and wars, the accelerating disappearance of animal and plant life. At the same time, much further down the page or screen, we read other stories, how communities are banning plastics, how market gardens are flourishing in what were once food deserts, how aging populations are thriving in newly created city centers, how new coral is reviving from bleached reefs. And if we start looking further afield at documentary videos and films, social media streamings, notice graffiti and street art, we see how new media and different technologies are helping people to imagine different lives, combat racism, reclaim histories, enjoy aging bodies, accept diverse sexualities, shift notions of disabilities, and imagine varied and exciting futures. I realize that I paint a privileged response to deep injustice, inequalities, and climate change. I, like most of you, live with such privilege. Yet we no doubt feel that we have still not dug deep enough, not read enough, not thought enough, not felt enough, not done enough. And I would add, we might also secretly struggle not to turn away from all the chaos. In this lecture, I want to show you why we need to keep engaging with a sense of humbleness and compassion for others, including non-human others, in order to learn to live with the mess we are undoubtedly in and to think into the future, however privileged we are, however troubled we feel. Our messy, globalized world demands a complex reading of interconnections among our everyday. Our expectation of policy and our sense of the other, our imagination and our future. Before I joined Academe, I was an editor, writer and advocate, where telling stories was part of my trade to connect with and convince my audience. Also, as a professor, I see the power of stories that challenge and change our views, our actions and our ways of living together. So, what kinds of stories can I tell you in order to fire your imagination and sense of responsibility and wonder? This lecture sets out why I find feminism and sustainable development important by telling three stories. From those stories, I explain the major concepts informing the theoretical framework of feminist political ecology, and then share with you what I plan to be doing in the next years as professor and as coordinator of the EU Marie Curie Innovative Training Network called WIGO, which we launched earlier today. The first story is about learning from historical world encounters as we recognize painfully how extractivism of natural resources and erasure of other cultures are underpinning progress, modernity and development. The second story is about possibilities in the practice and visions of local communities learning to live well together. The third story is about imagining the future with compassion and how we can shape the role of technologies, nature and culture. Before diving into the stories, I want first to explain the title of the speech, in case you were wondering. If there is a take two, then what was take one? <coughs> Feminism and Sustainable Development, take one, refers specifically to one of my first visits to ISS, when I organized a workshop with academics, activists, and policymakers on critiques of sustainable development. The workshop happened 25 years ago, in 1993, when ISS was housed in the Hotel Witterberg. The event was just after the UN Conference on Environment and Development, known as the Earth Summit, held in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, when sustainable development was placed squarely on the global development agenda, just as it is now back on the development agenda after the second Rio Summit in 2012 on sustainable development leading to the Sustainable Development Goals. Take two, 
refers to today and what I hope to do now, working as the, at the ISS as Professor of Gender Diversity and Sustainable Development. I am older, still a feminist and still involved in the same issues, but I am no longer crossing borders between policy and academe as a civil society advocate. I am now squarely ensconced in academe and in addition have just been awarded a grant of nearly 4 million euro to pursue my dream project of the Uyghur. In take two, I am not on the margins of the debates, one of the provocateurs from civil society, but a professor with an established path and voice, with the mandate to bring feminist political ecology, theory and practice to policymakers engaged in the agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals. So part of what this lecture is about is what does it mean to find myself, a quarter of a century later, still thinking and concerned about the same issues, but as a professor rather than as an advocate? Beyond the personal, there are some important political questions to ask, not the least being, why are these issues still on the table? My stories come from my own life experience, reflections, memories, readings and writings. In using this methodology, I'm following a long tradition of feminist scholars interested in changing nature social relations. I want to acknowledge in particular Val Plumwood, the late Australian philosopher, whose haunting story about how she survived a crocodile attack has helped me to think about how we need to reimagine ourselves ecologically, understanding our connection with the world of animals, plants and minerals, or what Plumwood poetically called Earth Others. My first story is a memory from childhood. On a hot summer day, the whole family, two parents, four children, was driving through the Australian bush in a battered Holden station wagon, following the other protesters. I was 12 years old, an awakening to difference and injustice. It was in the years of the US-Vietnam War, and my father was chairperson of the campaign for peace in Vietnam. Draft dodging students would hide in our house. Police would watch our Adelaide suburban home after someone tried to blow the car up. In that same car, we were, on that particular day, not off on a peace demonstration, but off to a silent vigil for black rights at a prison. I remember being mildly surprised to know of the numbers of indigenous peoples still in my town. I had been told at school that they had moved on a century and a half earlier when white settlers came, when the free colony of South Australia had been founded in the 1830s. Either that or, sadly, they had died due to infections. What I remember as we drove back was seeing one of the women protesters on the back of a motorbike whipping off her shirt and riding joyously bare-breasted, her blonde hair flying in the wind as she waved at us when she and her partner sped past. Exuberant sexuality and pleasure in life mixed strangely with the occasion. What do I want to unpack from this memory? For me, this memory indicates a displacement of my comfortable sense of self on different levels. My young self's understanding of justice, white privilege and embodiment intersect. The moment of going to a vigil about black prisoners interrupts my earlier history of white settler living, which conveniently removed the suffering of the original owners of the land and retold the history of settlement in ways which erased other cultures and lives. My sense of justice is about fairer conditions in a prison, the state is defining guide to law and order, and the question was about the number of blacks in prison and the need for better treatment. I was, of course, learning from my parents. They were the first generation of university-educated white Australians in their family. They were rebelling against their parents' idea of civilization and state authority that imprisoned blacks and sent young men overseas to an unjust war, both population groups who could not vote. They were in solidarity with students and imprisoned Indigenous people. While they were all for justice and democracy, including women's economic and political rights, they were not so sure about sexual freedom. My memory of the blonde students' exuberance recalling Marian Faithful's songs of women's liberation and sexual provocation was another form of breaking conventions. Her rebellious enjoyment of her body was also an act of protest, surprising and challenging social norms. This memory made me excavate further, and I want to share what I have uncovered about the history of the place where I was born. Unlike what I was taught, the founding of South Australia as a free colony in 1836, annually commemorated in Glenelg at the Old Gumtree, 
Indigenous people had never disappeared, gone on walkabout in the bush. Unlike the rest of Australia, South Australia was not considered to be terra nullius. The South Australia Act in 1834 acknowledged Aboriginal ownership, but the Aborigines Act of 1911 gave the South Australian State Aboriginal Department full legal control of the welfare of all Aboriginal people, including to have custody, place in institutions and educate Aboriginal children. My house was built in 1890 on the traditional lands of the Kalwandila band of the Kauna people. The initial settlement of the Adelaide era took place without any conflict, partly because it happened in summer when the Kauna traditionally moved from the plains to the foothills. Settlers for the first decades lived alongside the camps of Whirlies, stick and bark homes, and they were civilising missions and attempts by settlers to learn the language. But by 1854, the thousand people reported living in the area around the old gum tree was reduced to 180. They had been devastated by smallpox and typhoid, brought by Europeans and the resulting pollution of the river torrents and the fish and animal life gone. In 1879, the Kauna were declared extinct. This is a long-lasting narrative of extractivism, of natural resources and the erasure of indigenous cultures. Kauna people are positioned as peripheral to the dominant narrative of settler colonialism and white Australia, in which cultural loss and environmental damage is understood as inevitable to the extent that it blends into something seen as natural. It is difficult to reconstruct histories of those early encounters in South Australia because the records of the white settlers conflict, conflict with the oral history of the Kauna. One narrative speaks of peaceful settlement in what were seen as largely unoccupied lands, the other of frontier conflict and violent displacement. These are the narrative battlegrounds between the documented and imagined history of white settlement and the Aboriginal oral history of the frontier that now come out in land right claims. While there are now sorry days as public healing processes of reconciliation for indigenous and non-indigenous Australian people, unmet land claims continue, as do incarceration, poor health and poverty. The historical and environmental damage continues to be embodied in living memories. There is also the narrative battleground around women, sexuality and gender violence. The Kauna people, according to histories, had relatively free sexual relations. Kauna's open reunions among men and women were encouraged as much as by women as by men. Anglo-European settler invasion led to Kauna women being captured by sealers in raids on the mainland. These women were kept as slaves on Kangaroo Island, forced into sex work and hard labour. Children who were born were seen as expendable, and records indicate some were killed at birth. I found on the internet a photo of the last of the Kauna people, a woman called Ivarici, who died in 1931. Her eyes are haunting. But in revised histories, she is no longer considered the last of the Kauna people. Beginning in the 1970s, the histories of the Kauna people have been reclaimed based on culture, place and language, and a group of Aboriginal people have now re-emerged to identify as Kauna. The pain and sorrow of this history is about human suffering, tied to invasion of land, violence and destruction. But it is also about survival and changing possibilities, not only in the newly emerging Kauna identity, but also in the knowledges contained in the dreaming stories. These dreamings make me wonder, what can we learn from thousands of years of stories that build on the connectedness of people and culture with the worlds of plants, the animals and the stars when we speak of sustainable development? The second story is about possibilities, how local communities are organising socially and economically in order to live well together. When moving to Europe, I have found connections with the landscapes of Italy, where I have lived since 1987, in particular with the beauty of Lago di Bolsena, a volcanic lake in northern Lazio. The economies and ecologies of Bolsena have lasted for millennia. Today they are shaped by seasonal tourism, failing agriculture, youth unemployment and a dwindling population. Despite the idyllic views, the impacts of climate change, overfishing, lack of adequate sewerage for new housing and the influx of waste from shoreline hotels and agricultural chemicals are poisoning the lake. These conditions have sparked off local organising. Community groups hold town hall meetings lobbying to fix the, lake's, the lake's filter pumps to set up echo islands around the town. 
to encourage biological farming and to stop potential fracking in the area. There are cultural associations that promote the area's Etruscan history, pottery, local wine and food, and are part of the region's environmental and slow food movements. Several women run the region's slow food restaurants, ecological wine bars and biological cheese farms. Some have joined the No Fracking in Viterbo and its Surrounds campaign that threatens the region's geothermal stability with grave consequences for the lake. I see it as a place where new economic and ecological imaginaries are emerging. My focus for the second story is Punti di Vista, a cultural association that since the early 1990s has been custodian to a 7th century Franciscan monastery. I remember my first visit to the convento, the stunning view of the lake, and the simple beauty of the cloisters as you entered. In the convento, I have found an oasis of possibility. The 10 founding members, just out of university, came to the convento in 1992 in order to set up a community working for peace, social, and economic justice. The first thing they did was spend four years rebuilding the ruins of the convento. And inspired by Gandhian principles, they aimed to live the changes they wanted to see in the world. In the late 1990s, they turned to community projects in and outside of the convento. One project was Much Ado About Rubbish, in which waste time was transformed into pieces of art. Exhibitions were held at the convento and in Rome, and the association contributed to a TV and radio campaign. They were also involved in a project called Jewels of Scartier, involving homeless people who made their livelihoods by scavenging. Some of the homeless people went on to sell artistic objects created from waste materials called Eye of the Recyclone. The reduction of waste at the source continues to be a major problem today in Lazio, with private waste management on the one hand and the packaging industry and rapidly changing food safety regulations on the other. I joined Punti de Vista in 2008 when the convento was opening its doors to national and international groups. The convento is now a space for intellectual campaign work as international national groups visit over the summer seasons to write, strategize and plan together. Local groups are also welcome at the convento. One folkloristic group is the Tusha, the, it's the Tusha Laundry Women, formed in, in 2013. Their performance in old white linen and lace helps to reshape the local geographical historical landscape by a revaluing of women's labour, challenging the patriarchal histories of church and state that dominate Bolsena. The discussions of Punti di Vista are metered by the everyday politics of taking care of family, animals, olives and grapes, and keeping an ancient building running. These discussions are about not only money, but also time and responsibility for the care work and long-term commitment and vision. My involvement in Punti di Vista carries with it an awareness of how hard it is to take up our full responsibility to others. In this case, the beautiful structure of the convento, the fragility of the lake, and the balancing of travel, work, family, and community activities. I have become acutely aware of how much we take for granted care practices by those behind the scenes who allow activist research and policy engagement. Even though I am speaking of one place, Bolsena, it is rooted, networked, and connected to many other places of feminist action. It is an example of how people negotiate place as they protect and conserve, as well as enhance and modify landscapes, and create connections with other people, earth others, and other places on different scales. In describing the rooted networks connecting places and people and earth others to the past, engaging and shaping the landscape of the Lake of Bolsena, there is still the question of the future. What is the potential for a flourishing life world centered around the beauty of a volcanic lake as youth unemployment and pollution increases, tourist numbers dwindle, fracking looms, and the EU and the state power seems far, far away? The third story imagines the future we want. How can we shape the role of technologies, nature, culture, and compassion in our future? When reading for this lecture, I discovered that there is a methodology described as social science fiction, which theorizes about the future and current social and technological developments. We can use the tools of social science and speculative fiction to explore our present moment and what may lie ahead. 
I was encouraged by this to write a third story, a social science fiction. I am deeply inspired by Donna Haraway, who draws together cultural studies, international relations and feminist theory. Her use of art, and in particular her writing and conversations with the Australian artist Patricia Piccinini, have led to several visual futuristic feasts for my political ecology lectures. As we look to the future, we need to imagine ways to bridge difference and cultures as well as changing economies and deeply altered landscapes. The virtual world is now deeply embedded in our cultural, social and political lives. This is part of our contradictory pluriverse as modern digital interconnectivity interlocks the real and the virtual. The term pluriverse refers to the world making capacity towards ways of being and doing that are deeply attuned to justice and the earth. Such connectivity grows in unplanned directions, even with state and business surveillance and control. There is a dark side to our virtual connectivity and its domination by Facebook, Google and Apple. Yet I want to imagine what could be possible if the values I hold were to create a different form of digital interconnectivity in a future life world. So let me take you there now. Imagine you are in a small town in 2118, somewhere in Western Europe, in a life world where feminist political ecology values inform all material and virtual interactions. Now you have arrived. I invite you first to put on your personal computer armlet. This allows you to be connected to a shared flow of information stored in the Femicom, like the 21st iCloud. Femicom is the virtual means by which peoples and other life forms can communicate via instant communication in every spoken and digital language. As you adjust the armband and to the sensation of being connected in this new fluid way to other life forms, let us visit one community called Comcares. Welcome to the Kawi Comcare. Here you see how people are living together in resilient and beautiful structures. They design from old and new materials. It is self contained and seamlessly connects energy, food and waste sources in a recycling program. Each Comcare creates an enabling environment which provides sustaining technologies which ensures everyone is able to respect and care for all life forms. I see you puzzled. Perhaps I should explain further the concept of femiability. Femiability replaces the term you are familiar with, sustainability. Femiability is the collective cultural expression of life forms living together on the planet with peace, respect and dignity, where nurturing is given the highest respect. Femiability is about caring for and respecting creativity and diversity in all life forms. It is also about ensuring a healthy balance and well-being of shared resources with enjoyment and pleasure. In this life world, there are no violations of any sort practiced throughout the planet. So what is labour in this life world? The process called procreate has replaced the old concept of the means of production. Now there is an equal distribution of resources that follows the evolving values of femiability. And what about reproduction? Some people in the Comcare are connected through repro partnerships. These are the arrangements which have replaced old heteronormative marriage and family structures. In repro partnerships, people come together to care and nurture people animal and plants of different ages, starting with newborns, who, whether born naturally or via technological processes, become part of a comcare. Using femiboid technologies, it is possible for people to choose a mix of biological and technological reproduction. The pleasure associated with reproductive processes is via peaceful and non-violating ways of stimulating bodily and mental senses, via touch, meditation, or other more advanced digital modes of exciting the imagination and senses. There is no need for old terms such as gender, race, and ethnicity. Now, let us return to 2018. I do not know if this is the future you want, where technologies fuse with the biological, where there is no violence and life worlds are based on virtual interconnection, communication, and knowledge, shared and accessible to all. A world where gender does not exist and where reproduction is not about sex per se a serene existence that reflects values based on creativity, community and care, where livelihoods are determined by the needs of steady state economy rather than growth. But I hope it got you thinking. This imaginative interlude sets the scene for some further explanation of the concepts informing feminist political ecology. 
In the next part of the lecture, I turn to what feminist political ecology brings to an understanding of gender diversity and sustainable development as an important part of my work as a professor and as coordinator of WIGO. My stories spoke of histories, possibilities and futures. But again, I pause to turn off my, you know, I, I pause in order to translate the stories into my professorial title of Gender Diversity and Sustainable Development. So why did I choose that title? I contend that gender is a profoundly important concept with which to analyse the world. Gender is lived differently in different places, bodies and locations. As my stories indicate, moving toward a gender equal society involves profound systemic change, as well as change in everyday life and personal contact. The stories also indicate that speaking about gender alone is not enough. Only focusing on gender power relations obscures differences within the categories of woman or man or other genders. That is why I also use the term diversity, which points to how relations among women and men and other genders are imbued with differences of race, ethnicity, class, caste, age, physical ability and sexual orientation. It matters not only what gender you identify with, but also with what class, race, religion you belong to and how they intersect structurally and relationally. It is these intersections which determine if individuals belonging to different groups can access social and economic resources, exercise their reproductive rights and how they can engage in political and cultural change processes. The intersections among institutional individual differences are important to understand in the search for inclusiveness and economic and social justice for all persons regardless of gender, race, age, or class. So how does gender and diversity relate to sustainable development, to changing ecologies, to increasing inequalities of self and the other, to our histories, as well as to our fears and emotions about our futures? This is, for me, where feminist political ecology comes in. As my story suggests, understanding the nexus amongst gender diversity, the environment, and the economy is complex. It requires understanding the politics of gender, embodiment, difference, privilege, as well as emergent and hybrid economies. Let me now take you through these terms, illustrating them from the proposed research projects from WeGot. The politics of gender. As you have gathered from my stories, gender is not just a descriptive category or just about analysing men and women and other gender roles. As in my first story, when I, as a young girl, I learned about embodiment, race, and ecological belonging, our sense of self as gendered subjectivities is produced from the multiple and intersecting exercise of power within economic, socio-natural networks and in our everyday practices that are continually renewed in the material environments we live and experience. Let us take a further example from one of the Uyghur research projects. Realising safe and accessible localised food systems in Europe has led to many initiatives that have created new food practices, such as urban community gardening initiatives in cities. There are particularly vivid community gardening scenes in the cities of Berlin and Bas Barcelona, run by migrant communities from the Middle East and North Africa in economically marginalised neighbourhoods. These gardens are not only considered as spaces of ecological interaction and food justice, but also as sites of inclusion and empowerment of migrants. Gender relations are being shaped in everyday practices of creating new types of local food systems where women and men negotiate and engage in new practices of food preparation, communal eating and social provisioning. A WeGo PhD project will examine how these practices lead to changes in gender relations as a sense of belonging and social inclusion shift and practices of social reproduction are renegotiated in these communities evolving ecological practices. Embodiment. Embodiment is key to material and emotional dimensions of how we live. Our experience of how our bodies connect us to others through scales of meaning from the intimate to the global, from whose hand we hold to how our bodies are linked to others in global legal agreements. How we perceive and are perceived in our fleshly selves shapes our understanding of self in important ways as we go through our life cycle, interact with others, are accepted or not in different institutions, social, economic and cultural groups, endure marks of oppression or privilege. As illustrated in my story of the student on the motorbike defiantly expressing her sexuality, bodies are sites of cultural meaning, social experience and political resistance. 
The corporal, fleshly, material existence of bodies is deeply embedded in political relations, from historical colonialism and agricultural practices to population control policies and the contemporary biopolitics of migration. An example from Wigo's research is a PhD project that will look at conditions in Japan which foreshadow the likely scenario in Europe of depopulation, ageing, food insecurity and declining rural agricultural, economic and social vitality. The focus will be on senior women who have been active in rural enterprises that have involved significant natural resource management over the past decade. The focus will be on the everyday, embodied interdependencies among senior women entrepreneurs, consumers and nature created through community food economies. I've spoken a lot about difference and privilege of gender, ethnicity, age and race. Feminist political ecology is consciously addressing race in relation to difference in privilege by looking at how racialized processes shape human <coughs> environmental relations. Studies examine how racial difference is closely related to inclusion and or exclusion to rights of access, use and management of forest, land, water and other natural resources and unequal distribution with households and communities. The struggle for ownership over land in Adelaide, which I describe in story one, both historically and today, continues to be informed by racism. We need to pay attention to caste, ethnicity, and regional ethnic nationalism, markers that are all intricately bound to race, racism, and racialization, and that in turn shape the relationship between gender and the environment. Race is fundamental to understanding international development and narratives of modernization and progress. For example, one of the WIGO projects will examine evolving rural-urban linkages which are creating new value chains with political and ecological consequences in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu. It will look at the intersection of these food chains with notions of caste, gender, religion and age. It will examine how food movements reconnect different groups of people and investigate how much this process is truly opening up an inclusive democratic space. Feminist political ecology looks as, at ecologies as evolving, informed not only by physiological and agricultural practices, but also by government policy, household and community practices, as well as environmental movements. In Bolsena, the Convento brings together groups interested in permaculture, local so, so, slow food production, biological winemaking, recycling, water management and gender equality as part of the community practices for sustainability in the territory of Tusha. These local activities reflect and inform the current global concerns around sustainable development. The sustainable development agenda is embedded in different local, national and global policies and is determined by people with different levels of power to decide and to access resources. From a feminist political ecology perspective, the sustainable development goals can be studied on a variety of scales, going beyond the obvious need to study agricultural practices, waste, water and forest management, we can examine forms of networked and rooted interactions in institutional development practices. Resources, knowledge and power determine how political ecology is shaped. Understanding emerging and hybrid ecologies involves not only observing and studying, but also self-reflection and awareness of your own positioning as a researcher and engagement in political ecological processes. It means situated objectivity, which looks at the possibilities for negotiation as well as the limitations and dangers of sustainable development projects as practiced by governments, powerful conservation NGOs and private interests. The term hybrid indicates that there is no pure nature to be studied or pure culture to understand. Haraway usefully brings the two terms together when she talks about nature culture and in so doing transgresses the idea of a binary opposition of nature and culture. My three stories of the changing ecologies of Adelaide and Bolsena and my imagined future speak to how ecologies are fluid, emergent hybrids, evolving out of the historical, economic and environmental change, human and non-human interactions. An example of hybrid emergent ecologies, one of the WIGO PhDs, in one of the WIGO PhDs, will look at the crisis of small-scale fisheries due to in interconnected ecological and economic processes. The focus will be on the pressures experienced by small-scale fishing communities due to the decline in European fish stocks. The PhD research will look at efforts towards commoning in coastal communities, including guilds that have taken their fishing quotas out of speculation markets and formed alternative markets and new forms of labelling to source fish back to particular boats and fishing techniques.
My stories and the planned research projects from WeGo are informed by a relational approach to political ecology. Feminist political ecology invites us to step out of the bounds of modern science and economic thinking to look at political ecology as a relational and fluid social process. My third story about utopian femiability contributes to a feminist imaginary of how to transform the negative into the positive, defining the contours of possible alternative life worlds. The work of J.K. Gibson Graham helps us to think differently and with the same sense of possibility and hope about economic and ecological values in ways that decenter capitalism as the only economic framework. Taking up a community economies approach, feminist political ecology uses grounded reflections to politicize, reimagine, and recreate socio ecological relations. By looking at practices in place and among communities, Feminist political ecology is redefining sustainability as rooted in cultural identities and local ecological and economic processes, scaling up to the global larger picture. So while we go, for example, may be engaging in the bigger project of sustainable development goals, it is doing so by exploring what is happening in specific places, which are negotiating life and livelihoods in human damaged environments. In this exploration of sustainability among communities, Feminist political ecology also calls attention to emotions, feelings, the spiritual, non-scientific knowledges and interactions with non-humans, with technologies, life and death. Now again, I need to pause and ask, do you detect in my stories and framing of feminist political ecology something whimsical as I talk about lakes, idyllic communities, caring for human and earth others? I admit that in Take One of Feminism and Sustainable Development, I was all for upfront activism, getting the numbers right and hardline politics. But in Take Two, I've begun to sense that humans depend and are sustained by the non-human world. I have been drawn back to the writings of ecofeminism and the need to de-center humans in understanding development processes and the need to make more visible non-Western cultures' knowledge on how to generate sources of sustenance. I have become more humble about the otherwise of non-Western cosmologies and curious about how to make deeper links among ecology, economy, non-human and human lives. I have found myself interested in alternative economies based on mutuality and redistribution among humans and non-humans and to consider compassion as a key element to my work. Over 50 years ago, Rachel Carson warned that the attempt by humans to control nature was arrogant dangerous and would lead to disaster. The uncomfortable questions Carson asked in 1962 are even more vital today, as we cannot help but recognise that we need to understand far better how humanity is part of nature, and therefore if we exploit nature, we are directly exploiting ourselves, our health, our well-being and our future. So a major set of questions for feminist political ecology is how to bring together the human and the non-human, the biological with the technological and the material with the virtual. In seeking to think how to go beyond such dualisms, it is crucial to open up questions around the scientific truth of nature, knowing that nature and culture are tightly knotted in bodies, ecologies, technologies and times. We need to change the story of finite systemic coherence. Allow me to quote Haraway directly. Together and separately, the sciences and the arts need to be passionately practiced and enlarged as means to attune rapidly evolving ecological, natural, cultural communities, including people, through the dangerous centuries of irreversible climate change and continuing high rates of extinction and other troubles. So how do I propose to translate all these ideas and hopes into societally, something societally and policy relevant? This is a major strategic move, given that the Sustainable Development Goals are high on the development agenda, and there is a space for feminist political ecology to come to the fore with well-positioned and engaging research based on stories that matter and care. Weagle will build from local engagement and knowledge of people's practices and visions of how to live on this planet under climatic conditions never before experienced. Weagle will co-produce knowledge on how hybrid and emergent ecologies are creating new forms of livelihoods and care activities in response to a growing lack of resilience of the economy and the ecosystem. 
With that knowledge, we will then engage in the debates now being opened up by the Sustainable Development Goals in order to bring the stories of people's changing historical and current experiences of care for the environment into the policy arena. Such grounded and engaged research will not only be about collecting data and evidence, but also about understanding political processes, including the contradictions, the emotions and embodied reactions of people to economic, social and environmental change. In selecting the areas for investigation, WIGA has chosen climate change and resilience, community economies, population and body politics as the three themes which we felt were most vital for policy debates on sustainability. Following our research, there will be a three-year process of ongoing engagement, academic and policy debates with network meetings in Brighton, Montevideo, Bolsena and Brussels. And we will organise a major conference back here at ISS together with the degrowth movement in 2021. I began the lecture by asking what difference it makes to be an advocate or to be a professor working on gender diversity and sustainable development. Students here at ISS are always asking me, so if the world is so unfair, so unjust, what can I do about it? One of my colleagues tells me, you should reply, but that is not what you are here at ISS to learn. But is that true? There is a partial truth to such a reply. Unfortunately, there are no blueprint solutions to social injustice written up in textbooks, and each troubling issue has a history, context, and politics behind it. We cannot explore everything at ISS. However, I would argue that what is exciting and important about having the space and privilege to engage in postgraduate study is that you can learn from different stories, and you can learn to tell the story that counts for you and your community at whatever scale you want, convincingly. Complex social, economic and environmental problems require research designs capable of capturing different understandings of the world and processes of change from diverse perspectives. Such stories are not just about knowing, but are also about noticing the ordinary effects and emotions, about considering the everyday and your own self-reflection and engagement when listening to others' stories. It is also important not to ignore what goes on behind the scenes. For example, the politics of insider knowledge and negotiations around sustainable development. And it is important to undertake inquiry with compassion for others while aware of our innate power and privilege as academics. I asked at the beginning of the lecture the question, why are the same issues still on the table 25 years later? My partial answer is because the insights of feminist political ecology were not taken into account. Decision makers did not grasp why understanding the dynamics of gender and diversity in ecological, technological and political economic processes is key to building resilient, equitable and sustainable development. In this lecture, I have shown how important it is that we recognise the cracks and fissures in the story of finite, systemic coherence of unsustainable economic growth. I have also indicated how feminist political ecology can help to guide us along the track as we engage in encounters with different life worlds, form connections amongst communities, understand our relationship with Earth others, and link exciting research to effective policy. I hope I have convinced you that as we journey together, our success will depend on us being fully aware of how gender and diversity is crucial for today's sustainable development agenda. I would like to thank my family and friends who have supported me for so many years and in so many places. A special thank you to all who have travelled far to be here today, especially my parents who have come all the way from Australia. I would like to thank the Rector and the ISS staff, particularly those working with me in the Civic Innovation Research Group, Institute Council, Political Ecology Research Group and Social Policy for Development Masters. I'm also grateful to the WeGo Network, those who are here today and those who will join us in the future. A special thank you to my students, especially those who organised and attended the five reading circles leading up to this inaugural. Thank you to the young artists and designers and filmmakers who contributed the beautiful artwork for this presentation and the wonderful films. Indeed, thank you, a huge thank you, to all the people organising the celebratory events of this day. Most of all, those who have shown so much care behind the scenes. I will have a chance to thank you personally later. And finally, 
thank you to my audience, to every one of you who has come to listen to my inaugural lecture as part of the ISS events organised for International Women's Day. I am honoured that we can collectively remember and celebrate the achievements of women all over the world.